Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Doug Hoffman. I'm filling in for Ryan Cruz this morning um, as the host of this ultrasound case series. Ryan is in Central America with uh, the U.S. Men's National Soccer Team, so I am the fill-in. Um, and today, um, I'm looking forward to a talk by uh, Ryan Nussbaum. From, he's the fellow at the University of Pittsburgh, um, and he's going to talk on proximal adductor magnus tendinopathy. Um, Ryan, like I said, is fellow Pittsburgh. He's going to stay on his faculty. He did his uh, PMR residency in Northwestern. Ryan has an interest in adaptive sports as well as ultrasound education. So we're really looking forward to this. So Ryan, I'm, without further ado, I'm going to hand this off to you. Okay. Hey, sure. Let's get the screen going here. All right. Okay, everything's looking good? Yes, looking good. Excellent. Okay, great. So um, thanks, Dr. Hoffman. I really appreciate uh, the introduction and I'm really excited to contribute to this case series. Um, thanks to everyone who's contributed uh, during ex existence. It's been really helpful for uh, building my knowledge base and um, hoping to contribute to that today. And, and um, would love to hear feedback or insight from uh, people on the call for uh, managing this type of uh, case. So today we're going to talk about a uh, groin pain in a 17-year-old male hockey player. And first, I want to uh, thank um, my assistant program director, Dr. Allison Schrader, and my program director, Dr. Kentaro Onishi, uh, for helping with this case and really just for a great year of training. Uh, thank you very much for that. All right, so let's get on with the case here. Objectives, we're going to understand the protocol for sonographic evaluation of the medial hip and apply it to a specific case, and then we're gonna write a comprehensive ultrasound report for the medial hit. So our athlete uh, was coming in with this right groin pain, 17 year old hockey player. Three weeks ago, he was playing and was really being checked into the boards and trying to resist that with his right leg, um, where he started to have some discomfort in the groin during that uh, mechanism. And so he tried to keep playing, but he was having persistent pain after the game, he didn't see any bruising or swelling, but uh, kind of been over the next week, he was having persistent difficulty with skating with crossover maneuver, full extension and increasing speed. Uh, he tried to take a week off and was also doing some Voltaren gel, NSAIDs and Theragun and um, really wasn't getting the relief he was looking for. So from a physical exam perspective, functionally his two-legged squat and gait were, um, were fine. And when he did his right single leg squat, when his knee got to about 30 degrees of flexion, he started to have some valgus in the knee and he had some anteromedial hip pain. When he did the right hop test, that caused some anteromedial hip pain as well. Neurologically, he was intact. And then looking at the hip, he had full range of motion without pain. The scour and stinch field caused the anteromedial hip pain. And he had, uh, with resisted adduction, this caused some pain in that anteromedial hip region as well and he was tender to palpation over the proximal adductor tendons. When we looked at the core area, when he did an abdominal crunch, this did not produce any of his symptoms. So these are the uh, radiographs that we collected during the clinic. And so essentially we have a weight-bearing AP and then weight-bearing false profile view. It's a skeletally mature individual and looking at the hip, um, essentially seems appropriate for his age. And um, that's what the radiologist thought as well, that this is a normal appearing radiograph. And so the next step, we went on to do a uh, medial hip uh, diagnostic ultrasound. And so this is the scanning protocol that we were referring to. And a lot of this comes from the AMSSM uh, fellowship uh, guidelines uh, for ultrasound. And so basically what we looked at was the first column, the adductor muscles and tendons, pubic bone and symphysis, pectineus, distal rectus abdominis muscle and tendon, and the rectus abdominis adductor longus aponeurosis, uh, as well as the obturator nerve. And then there's this other section, a clinically indicated looking for a transversalis fascia insufficiency, as well as assessment of inguinal and femoral hernias. You are looking for additional hernias as well, such as like a spagellian. Uh, and then, so additional structures to consider. I mean, if we're gonna be uh, doing a complete exam, we're gonna need a joint to be evaluated. So a hip joint is what we would scan and then femoral nerve artery and vein. And then depending on 
uh, kind of what your suspicion is, you can look at Gracilis, Iliapsoas, Erectus femoris, and Sartorius. And so just to orient and kind of a quick refresher on how all of these structures are related, um, we wanted to go through the anatomy real quick. And so this uh, highlighted uh, structure is the pectineus. And as we go deeper in the anatomy, we see the adductor longus, then we have brevis, and then we have adductor magnus, which is most posterior. And just medial to that, you're gonna have the gracilis. And just wanna point out too, because I think a key thing here is there's a lot of overlap of these structures, right? So finding the pain generator can be challenging. And um, I think a good example of that is seeing this iliopsoas kind of right in the same region here. Um, and then as we, before we look at the abdominal musculature, there's even more superficial structures. If you consider the sartorius, uh, rectus femoris, um, there's just uh, a lot of areas that could be considerable um, pain generators. So when we look at the abdominal layers, uh, we have external oblique is most superficial, then internal oblique, then we have transverse abdominis and the rectus. Rectus and transverse abdominis are on a pretty similar level, um, but uh, just wanted to point that out. And then of course we have the femoral nerve artery and vein um, that will be seen as well. So when doing this scan, I think uh, positioning is really key, right? Um, there's, there's a couple of options. I think it's pretty common for uh, people to utilize the figure four position, um, but you'll also see where people will still apply an abduction and external rotation of the hip, but they might not flex the knee as much and they may keep that straight. And so when it comes to transducer selection, I think it's important to really utilize both linear and curvilinear transducers here, and particularly changing it when the structure of interest may be deeper or more superficial. And I think, you know, understanding the transducer is pretty close to the uh, patient's genitalia. I think privacy is really important, making sure the patient's comfortable. So utilizing a towel or a drape um, to make sure that they have full coverage, I think is important. And I know this was brought up previously in the case series where you know, it, it may be a good idea to have all undergarments removed prior to starting the scan. It can be a little tricky when asking the patient to remove a garment mid-scan and um, can just get a little uncomfortable. Um, so that's one consideration. And then I think having an assistant in a room can be helpful. I think it can provide some comfort for the patient and kind of a, a safety environment. And so I think I wanted to review a, a few figures from Morley et al. in Skeletal Radiology 2016. They were looking at a, a core muscle injuries. And when we think about how the musculature interacts with the, the pubis region, I think uh, orientation is key. So if we look at the rectus abdominis, it's pretty vertical as it comes in for insertion. Uh, conversely, the adductor longus has a, an angle to it. And I think we have to take that into consideration while doing this scan. And if you can think about it, if you would put someone into a figure four, you could imagine how this angle would, might become uh, larger and we have to uh, factor that in. And then also, I think this view does a nice job of describing how the adductor longus uh, really connects with the rectus abdominis and uh, right over the pubic symphysis and you'll hear it called aponeurotic plate, uh, but just understanding that there is a, a connection and continuity amongst the structures is really key. So we'll get started with the scan here. First thing we looked at was the hip joint. And so we have the femoral head and acetabulum. And really we weren't seeing any sort of effusion or cortical irregularity upon this view. And for the next one, we looked at the pectineus. And I think just understanding kind of where we can find this, it's if you have the femoral artery and vein, you come more medial, um, you'll see the pectineus and it's right above the acetabulum uh, near its origin. And so as we scan, it's gonna make its way over to the proximal femur. Um, having a little bit of uh, acoustic enhancement through the vasculature makes it a little challenging to see there. Um, I personally have not seen too much pathology in this region, but I think we should still take a look in this area and assure there's no uh, problem there. And so for this athlete, the pectineous muscle did appear normal. Next, we looked at the femoral nerve artery and vein. And, um, Essentially, we were using a little bit of compression here, and I think that can help, um, of course, differentiate the artery from the vein, but sometimes it can also help with better visualizing the femoral nerve as well. So this all appeared normal uh, when reviewing. 
And next we were looking at the adductor longus. And so what you can see here is that there's certainly an enlargement of the adductor longus tendon as it comes more proximal and there's a heterogeneous appearance to it. Also the pubis has a considerable cortical irregularity. And then um, looking in short axis, uh, there's also cortical regularity here, some heterogeneous appearance of that tendon. Next, we looked at the adductor brevis and um, saw some thickening as it became more proximal. Um, and also there is some of this cortical irregularity. Um, and then as we look at the, the longus brevis magnus, I think we're all familiar with kind of that orientation from superficial to deep. Um, but what's interesting, this scan demonstrates as you go from distal to proximal, uh, the origin of these tendons may not necessarily follow this um, order. So we'll just kind of see how that goes here as we come more. And I think this structure, I think really kind of captures that a little bit better in the sense that the adductor longus actually went deeper the brevis kind of stayed in a similar area and the magnus was also deep at the same time, but there's certainly a different configurement there compared to maybe three or four centimeters more distal. And uh, so this was a, a scan of the adductors as well. Um, and we're looking at a long axis here. And we're seeing some thickening of the, oops, sorry about that. We're seeing some thickening of the longus and brevis, and um, certainly that cortical irregularity again. And we saw some anechoic features of the bottom 50% of the um, adductor longus as well. Uh, I think another thing to point out is you're seeing this uh, hyperchoic structure uh, down in the adductor magnus, and um, just that was starting to pop up as we continued with the scan here. And so this is a picture in short axis of the adductors. And again, we have that hyperechoic, um, I'm sorry, one second. Do another sweep here. We have that hyperechoic signal right there in the adductor magnus um, level. And so we first commented on the longus and brevis muscle and tendon. There was thickening of the proximal adductor longus and brevis tendons with hypoechogenicity. There was an anechoic region of the deep lateral 50% of the adductor longus tendon without evidence of large defect or increase in size of the defect on dynamic resisted adduction. There was associated cortical irregularity at its origin of the adductor longus and brevis tendons on the pubis. No hyperemia, no sonopalpation tenderness, and there was normal echogenicity of the adductor longus and brevis muscles. So then we started to look more at the adductor magnus, um, specifically the pubofemoral region. So we know there's two origins to the adductor magnus. We have the pubofemoral, and then more posteriorly, we have the ischiocondylar. For this scan, we really focused on this pubofemoral. And uh, so this is a video looking at the adductor magnus and long axis here. And again, we have this hyperechoic uh, signal here with some um, acoustic shadowing underneath. And we took some measurements. So in long axis, we noticed that this um, hyperechoic structure was about 0 0.82 centimeters from the pubis. And then measuring it in long axis, about 1.2 centimeters. And going to short axis was about 0 0.83 centimeters. So in Describing it in the findings, this is a 1.2 centimeter proximal to distal, 0.83 centimeter medial to lateral hyperechoic region with posterior acoustic shadow that was present in the proximal adductor magnus pubofemoral tendon at the adductor portion, uh, 0.82 centimeters from the pubic bone. This corresponded to the patient's point of maximal tenderness with sonopalpation. With dynamic evaluation, the distance between the pubic bone and the hyperechoic region remains stable. There was no hyperemia in this region, though assessment may be limited by the depth of the target and required transducer pressure for optimal visualization. And a normal echogenicity uh, of the adductor muscle was identified. So we wanted to do a comparison study as well. So we did look at the left side 
uh, and we're not seeing any type of hyperechoic uh, structure there. Um, and then we did a sweep through the contralateral side as well. And again, no hyperechoic signal being identified. So the next structure we looked at was the gracilis. And I think it's important when scanning this area, um, you're gonna really have to have the patient externally rotate their hip uh, and have some type of abduction going on as well, uh, just because of how medial it is. So I think finding your adductor longus and then moving a little bit more posterior and medial, um, you're gonna see a superficial structure uh, and that's gonna be the gracilis. And, um, move over to center that, and then we follow it distal. It should stay in the same plane as you move distally. Um, and then we were looking at that also in long axis. And so when looking at this, when it gets near the pubis, the tendon is pretty short. Um, but when looking at this patients, essentially we thought the muscle and tendon appeared normal. And then we looked at the obturator nerves. I think we're probably all familiar with the anterior obturator nerve is between the longus and brevis, and then the posterior is between the brevis and magnus. We're looking at these in short axis. And we're moving essentially proximal to distal as we're looking at those. And um, those appear normal, and there was no sonotonel uh, positive findings. So next we looked at the transverse alus fascia, trying to see if there may be a disruption of that. So wanted to find the transverse abdominis and the rectus abdominis and look at that fascia in between. And so I think really for any type of hernias, it's definitely a good idea to consider doing this in supine, but also standing uh, because the standing may reproduce their symptoms uh, more frequently than if they were supine, um, just with the gravity effect uh, contributing. So having the patient bear down here, we weren't really seeing any sort of disruption of uh, that aponeurosis. So there was no large defect or fat visualized in this region with um, Valsalva maneuver. And so looking at the distal rectus abdominis, uh, start at the linea alba and we moved uh, more to the right rectus abdominis and followed that distally and short axis. And also we're looking at that in long axis as well, uh, moving from proximal to distal. And in general, I mean, we thought this did, appear, the rectus abdominis did appear normal. And so we then focused our attention on the rectus abdominis adductor aponeurosis. So proximally we have the rectus abdominis and then we have the aponeurosis between the two structures uh, and then the adductor tendon and of course the pubis as well. So and as we're uh, translating through this, you'll see that there's this anechoic signal at the D, probably like 40% of the aponeurosis. Um, and of course there's this cortical irregularity. So essentially we're calling that the, the aponeurosis uh, on the right appeared uh, thickened compared to the left and the deep 40% of the uh, right rectus abdominis, adductor longus aponeurosis appeared anechoic. There was no movement or elevation on, on dynamic examination with resistant straight leg rays or with resisted adduction. And we didn't see any hyperemia or sonopalpation tenderness. And so we then looked at the pubic symphysis and essentially were short axis to the um, rectus abdominis and we came distally. And as we translate through, we see cortical irregularity on both sides. The right is a little bit more severe compared to the left. And there was no sonopalpation tenderness with this. All right, so we did not look for inguinal hernias or femoral hernias for this patient, but I thought it was a good to at least review kind of some basic fundamental uh, anatomical landmarks if you would look for this in a patient. So really understanding where the inguinal ligament is gonna be key Superficial to that, you're going to have your inguinal hernias, um, or I should say proximal to that. So, um, and then with that, you find this inferior epigastric vessel. We know that lateral to that, we're going to have the indirect inguinal hernia, and medial to that, we'll have the direct inguinal hernia. And this is, of course, the uh, indirect is going to be following in the spermatic vessels or spermatic cord region. 
Um, and then it's good to know where this rectus is as a landmark as well. As you come distal to the inguinal ligament, you're gonna have the femoral vessels here, and this is where you would have the uh, femoral hernia. And this is a great article from Fitzgibbons Jr. in NEGM 2015. Definitely take a look just to kind of refresh on some hernia related topics. And so this is essentially our view of what it would look like if we did this. And so the inguinal ligament is a little bit oblique here. We have the femoral neurovascular bundle. And a, a little pearl with this, if you're looking for hernia in this region, uh, as the patient valsalvas, the vein should actually collapse. Uh, so if there's a hernia, the vein will collapse when they valsalva. But if there's no hernia and they valsalva, then the vein will dilate. And that's what we see here is a dilation of the vein. And then, so when looking for the direct uh, inguinal hernia, you want to find the inferior epigastric vessels. We have the rectus abdominis here, and we know that it's going to be more medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. And then, of course, laterally to that very similar image here is where you would start to see some recognition of an indirect inguinal hernia. But really, these hernias, uh, this topic probably deserves a lecture or maybe a series of lectures on its own. And it's, I think it requires a lot of experience before um, getting acclimated to this. But just wanted to go over some basics. So for the ultrasound report, uh, we put in the referring provider, the facility where it happened, the indication, study type, the location of the scan anatomically, and then the laterality of that, any imaging that occurred prior that we were comparing. We talk about the equipment used, the transducers used, and how we were saving the images. And then positioning was also mentioned, and the, the planes of how the images were taken were also described. And so these findings are what uh, we've already talked about in the report. Um, and then we get to the impression. And I think this is an important part to note that um, this area, there's, there's so many overlapping structures um, and there can be a lot of pathology, right? And I think it can be pretty challenging to uh, differentiate what actually is the, the pain generator. In this case, we were really relying on sonopalpation to try to differentiate this. And uh, that's, that's kind of what led us, uh, supported our, what we suspected was the pain generator. So um, the bolded one is, we wouldn't bold it in the report, but it's more just to say, this is what we're suspecting the pain generator is for this talk. So a 1.2 centimeter by 0.83 centimeter hyperchoic region with posterior acoustic shadow consistent with likely calcific bony avulsion of the proximal right adductor magnus located 0.82 centimeters from the pubic bone. Chronicity cannot be determined, but this corresponds to the patient's location of maximal tenderness. Uh, number two, there was thickening and hypoechogenicity of the proximal right adductor longus and brevis tendon origins with anechoic region in the deep lateral 50% of the adductor longus tendon. There is significant cortical irregularity of the pubic bone at the origins of the adductor longus and brevis. This is consistent with tendinopathy of the adductor longus and brevis and partial tear of the adductor longus. There was no sonopalpation tenderness in this location. For number three, uh, there was thickening of the right rectus abdominis adductor longus aponeurosis with the deep 40% of the distal aponeurosis appearing anechoic consistent with tear. There was no sonopalpation tenderness in this region. And at the number four, there was the cortical irregularity of the right greater than left pubic bones without uh, sonopalpation tenderness at the pubic symphysis. And I uh, just wanted to share a, a quick study because uh, I thought it was helpful in this scenario. Um, there was a recent study by Dahlia Dare and EJR 2021. They wanted to see how common adductor longus tendon pathology is in active people. And um, they're asymptomatic active people. So they had 45 people, 90 groins they were evaluating with ultrasound and abnormalities were found in all of the tendons. Um, so that we should expect to see some abnormality, particularly in active individuals. And it's really our job to determine, you know, what is the actual pain generator? And these are the different um, abnormalities found in that study. So these are the references here. And uh, thanks again, fathers on the call, enjoy your Father's Day weekend. And I'm definitely interested if anyone has any insights from this case. All right, Ryan, that was awesome. Um, you know, that, that's a complex area with uh, a lot of anatomy that sometimes is not very intuitive. Um, it can blend together, as you know. Yeah. Um, what do you, I mean, it, the bottom line is, you know, you, you feel that the adductor magnus is the, is the pain generator here. What do you make of that bony, in a sense, that bony fragment that's at the, 
Moscow Tenonish Junction. Yeah, I mean, we were kind of thinking this was um, maybe some sort of avulsion mechanism from the Pewis region is what we were suspecting. Um, just based on kind of putting together the, the mechanism as well as the um, just kind of the appearance of it. But at the same time, I think mentioned in the report, it's hard to understand the, the chronicity of that feature, um, that hypercoic feature. So um, I may, maybe more imaging would be indicated uh, to maybe see if there's any edema, maybe on an MRI, uh, but that, and again, we couldn't see any type of vascularity uh, just because of how deep the structure was, but I, it's definitely tricky. I think we, we had a tough time um, being super confident. I think we were pretty confident. Um, but yeah, it's tr what, how, how would you approach something like that? Or what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, let me back up a little bit. I just want to make a few comments and then I want to yeah. you know, kind of address that. Um, first of all, again, um, the goal of the case series is to talk about protocols and, and the uh, intricacies of the protocols as well as the report. So I, you did a really good job with that protocol. Um, I start out almost every single uh, lateral hip groin uh, hernia exam um, with the anterior hip joint as you do. And then I add you know, the, the muscles there. So that would be the iliopsoas, the rectus, artorias. And, um, and so in this case, in my protocol, I would have, when I'm doing the iliopsoas, and I don't do this normally, but in this case I would, I would put them in the figure four position and then look at the distal tendon of the iliopsoas as it attaches onto the lesser tuberosity because I've seen pathology there. Okay. Um, and so that would have been in my protocol. Um, and then after I do that, sort of what I would call limited anterior hip protocol, I do exactly what you do. I slide the probe in an anatomic transverse position over to the pectineus. And then what I look for at that is I try to get the femoral artery and vein in picture, and then the spermatic cord, which would be medial, just lying over the pubic tubercle. And that's a, it's a home base image uh, for me in the hernia exam. And the reason why I like that is for exactly what you talk about is I can do Valsalva in that position and I can see an obvious inguinal hernia because the spermatic cord would dilate at that point. Um, and I can see a femoral hernia right away. Um, if there's any hint or I may end up taking one or two more images uh, of the inguinal canal just to be sure in this case. Um, so I, I love that you slid over and looked at the pectineus muscle in that position, because I think that's a, a very valuable position. Uh, just a quick comment, you know, they, they, everybody talks about in femoral hernias that uh, the femoral vein uh, gets compressed. That's not been my experience. I've seen hundred femoral hernias. In small ones, the vein does not get compressed. Okay. Um, and so, and when I, for me to diagnose the hernia, I have to prove it in orthogonal views. And I'm, I'm actually gonna give a case uh, series on a, a case on a hernia, I think later this year. But, um, and so in, the case, in this case, you know, if I saw fem a small femoral hernia, which may not compress the vein, but I'm gonna prove it on long and short axis images of that. Um, so just, that's just a comment on the protocol. The other thing is it's so easy to get into the weeds here. And you start looking at, you know, adductor longus and brevis and magnus. And, it's, you know, where do you go? And it's easy to get lost when you see some pathology. So this is just a great example like you have done of literally writing down the protocol when this patient walks in and, and you stick with the protocol and you expand the protocol as necessary, but you don't leave anything out. Um, and then you have a thorough evaluation because it's, it's, it's so easy to see something and then you forgot to do one thing or forgot to do the other. Um, and so this is just a really nice illustration of, it's so easy to get in the weeds and the adductor pain um, and to write out the protocol, um, which essentially what you have done. Um, just a couple of things on uh, the scanning um, that you pointed out. Um, you know, if you're on short axis on the adductors, as you had mentioned, and you go proximal to distal, it's not intuitive, but the adductor brevis goes, basically disappears first. And so as you go 
uh, cod head, then you have the adductor longus and magnus in view. And so you can see that very well as you're scanning short axis on the adductors proximal to distal, and it's a way to easily identify the adductor magnus at that point. Okay. Um, so that's just a little trick that I've learned over the uh, years. Um, another really good illustration of this point is, first of all, your pronunciation of hockey. You know, uh, when I live in northern Minnesota, you have to say hockey, a eh? hockey, eh? okay, just just a little tiny thing here, but um, but you know, you get a hockey player, and, and this is common, and I'm sorry, hockey players, and um, and and as your case demonstrates, they have all sorts of pathology there. I've never seen um, a hockey player who comes in with groin pain and has a normal looking contralateral side. You know, yeah. so the adductor longus and the pubic symphysis are, you know, invariably abnormal. And so then the, the trick becomes is how do you decipher all of this? And, and for any of you that have ever been scanned in the groin region and uh, symphysis pubis, it is kind of tender in the normal state. And so it, it can be really tricky to decipher, you know, what is true pain with sonopalpation and what is in a sense, you know, the attritional change is associated with the sport that may not be symptomatic. And I think as you pointed out, you know, th there is a little difference in, in the way the pain is and, and to reproduce the pain. So if, if you're putting the probe over the pubic tubercle where the adductor longus uh, starts to blend in with the aponeurosis and, and it was all moth-eaten at that point. And they say, yeah, it's a little sore. And it says, well, is that your pain? Well, not really. And then you go down to the magnus and they say, yeah, that's more my pain. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, that can be tricky. And so in your report, when you say that was sonopalpation, I think that, you know, is really important. And that's the problem with, you know, hockey players uh, is he, go to a contralateral comparison and it can be very difficult because it can look very similar. And in this area, very subtle pathology can cause symptoms. And that pathology can be within the realm of these attritional changes that occur based on the sport. So it can be very difficult. Uh, and, and again, you did a nice job. Um, if you could go back to your report, I just wanna sure. make a couple comments. Um, one is the term anechoic. So anechoic means without. And so yeah. when you mean something is anechoic, what you're saying then is there is a tear. Yeah. So uh, if, I'm, if I'm looking at a tendon and it's hypoechoic and, and I'm losing some of that echo texture and I'm seeing some partial tearing, but I don't see an anechoic defect, I'm gonna say, you know, there's alteration of fibular echo texture. But when you say anechoic, then you're, you're saying there's a tear there. And when I look at, and I don't disagree with your description. Um, mm -hmm. When I looked at that adductor longus, there were anechoic clefts, so there was tearing in that, but that wasn't necessarily a source of the pain. Um, yes. And so I, I just wanna make that point that when you use the term anechoic, and essentially you're saying, I mean, anechoic we also use for fluid, simple fluid, but when you're using it in tendon, then you're essentially saying there's a defect there. Yeah. The other one thing about the report, I just wanna maybe bring up and in, in your conclusion, you're essentially describing things. And so yep. some could argue that that belongs in the body uh, of it, or you're just repeating what was in the body. And so your impression should be exactly that. And so, you know, one thought would be your impression can say, you know, um, uh, you could say attritional carrying, uh, tendinosis and partial thickness tearing of the adductor longus. However, you know, and you can even group all those attritional appearance that you didn't, appearing changes that you didn't think uh, were pain generators and say, uh, you know, there was no pain with sonopalpation. So, you know, this is like an asymptomatic finding. You can say correlate with clinical symptoms. But, uh, you know, in number one, you could say, and I, I would argue to say that I think this is a chronic appearing injury. So when you have you know, bone that has posterior acu acoustic shadowing, it's been there a while, that's not an acute injury. Um, there's nothing wrong with incorporating the history. And so if you think this is a symptomatic, chronic partial tear at the insertion of the adductor magnus, then I think it's okay to say, you know, chronic appearing 
partial thickness tear of the insertion of the adductor magnus onto the you know pubic ramus or you know superior pubic ramus. Um, this also corresponds to the maximal side of tenderness with some palpation. Yeah. Period. Um, so that's just a comment on the report. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Any other comments? Anybody want to jump in and have any thoughts? This is this is a uh, a complex case, Ryan. That you did a nice job of of, of picking apart. Um, we all see this. We all sometimes struggle with this. Um, again, living in northern Minnesota, um, I see tons of hockey players, and and it can be really challenging. I mean, it's amazing what fourteen year old hockey players. Uh, on the asymptomatic side look like on ultrasound. I mean, there's changes that occur, so. Yeah. So no more comments. Okay. Um, again, great job, Ryan. Good yeah, luck. Thanks. Yep. He's, Ryan's going to Ohio State, so good luck at Ohio State. Um, and, um, oh, no, Ryan, you're not going to Ohio. You're staying at No, Pistons. no, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna I was thinking of Michael. I was thinking of Michael the fellow at Iowa. Wow, is that a <laughs> Oof. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I believe we're back on in two weeks. I haven't actually looked at the schedule, um, but I believe we're back on in two weeks. So again, thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman.